This video is all about working with rec transforms in Unity. And Unity has their own set of tutorials, but their rec transform tutorial I think suffers from being a little overcomplicated. They're trying to show off all the features of rec transforms at once, um, instead of going through very simply and talking about how we actually build UIs. So as an example, I have a canvas and I have a dark blue container and I have a title, which is an orange. And I wanna set things up such that if I'm on my container and I move it around, my title fills up the top, but it doesn't change when I drag the bottom of my window. So these are the types of questions that we wanna answer, and that's what this video is all about. So to dive right in, the first thing to understand is the difference between a rect transform and a regular transform. And if we get rid of our anchors and we ignore a couple of these other things, we see that we still have a position, we still have a rotation, and we still have a scale just like we do on a regular transform, which means that I can move this just like I would any other 3D object. A rect transform is still a transform. And if I pop into 3D mode, you'll see that I still have all of my regular gizmos, and sure enough, this behaves like a 3D object. Now, most of the time when we work in, 2, in UI, we're gonna be working in 2D, so I'm gonna flip over to 2D. We have an extra tool which is the transform tool, sorry, the rec transform tool over here in the top bar. I can either click on that or I can press T to flip into that mode. And now you'll see I have a new set of gizmos. I can change the size of my element. I can drag it around. You'll see this little circle and you'll see this four set of four triangles. And these correspond to the extra things that we can do in rec transforms that we can't do in regular transforms. So back to my question, I wanted to make my child behave relative to its parent. In other words, I want this element to react to what's happening in its parent. And how I do that starts with this whole anchors thing. So if I control Z a little bit here, um, I have just a 500 by 500 pixel square. And if I go down to my element, you'll see that I've set my anchors, I've set my pivot, and I've set these offsets to various values to achieve this. So let's turn this off and let's walk through all the pieces and we're gonna talk about at the end how we recreate this element's behavior. So I'm gonna to go to UI and I'm gonna create an image. It doesn't matter, rec transforms work the same for images or text or complex things like buttons. And I don't really care about the name. And what you're gonna see is by default, we're sort of pinned to the center of our parent. Our size isn't gonna change, but as we move our parent, we're gonna stay in the center, both horizontally and vertically. And the magic behind that, whoops, is these anchors. So I'm gonna just click and drag this object away, and we're gonna see that I have this gizmo. This corresponds to these four numbers here. And I can drag this around. If I click the center, whoops, let's try that again. If I click the center, I can drag this around, and you're gonna see that things are listed as percentages and those exactly correspond to the fractions that you see in the inspector. So the first thing to note is that we are pinning to some percentage location on the parent, and that's what these numbers mean. Now, the second thing to note is that this can be broken apart. And if I do, it's gonna make me a box, basically, or a rectangle of some shape. So when I'm setting these values, I'm not actually setting the corners, I'm setting the sides. And to see that a little bit more clearly, I'm gonna set these to some easily identifiable values. So for instance, let's say that our X starts on the left at zero and our X goes to 0.5, the center. We're gonna see that our min and max X actually correspond to the left and right parts of this rectangle. And the same thing with our Y values. If we make our Y go from say zero up to one, then we're gonna see that we have made a rectangle that is the left half of our parent. So even though the gizmos that we can see are the corners, what these numbers correspond to are the sides. The left side is the min x, the right side is the max x, the bottom and the top correspond to these. And as we move these around, oh, that went faster than I intended it to. As we move these around, we'll see that those gizmos respond accordingly. Now you'll note that as I directly change these values in the inspector, that my image gets real wonky. And the reason for that is these offsets, left, right, top, bottom. 
And once you understand that we're talking about the sides here, it's pretty easy to understand that we're talking about the sides here when we talk about these offsets. So if I change these values to 0, 0, 0, 0, we're going to see that we entirely fill up the left half of our parent. And this is as a percentage. So as I change my parent, it's always going to be the left half. It doesn't matter how tall or how short it is. We can then define offsets from that parent. So let me just put in a value of 10 for each of these. And you'll see that we're moving in 10 from each side. And what is this 10? This is pixels. So these are percentages and these values are pixels. We've moved in 10 all around. And you can see that positive means inward. And likewise, if I make this negative, that means outward. So that's the direction for each one of these. So just setting this back to 10, you'll see that we have 10 pixels all around and we're still dynamic. If we take our parent and we move it, you'll note that we get smaller, but we still have on that left side always that 10 pixel boundary between this and the edge of our parent. And that's great for laying out UI elements. That's going to be very powerful. So we've seen what the anchors do, and we've seen what these offsets do. There's a couple more things to go over, and one of those is what happens if I reduce the number of anchors. So for instance, right now I have four different corners. What happens if I make the X go from zero to zero, say? Note that we now only basically have two anchors. We have an anchor at the top and an anchor at the bottom. Another thing to note is that the naming here has changed. If I hit Control Z, you'll see that I have left and right. But if I redo that, you'll see that I have a position and a width. So we're going to be defining the same thing. We're going to be defining offsets, but the numbers mean slightly different things. What we're saying now is from wherever our anchor is, and remember that our anchor is at a certain percentage. So I'm going to set this to say 0.25 and 0.25, and you'll see that we're a quarter of the way over. We then have a position offset from there to the center of our element. So note that right here, our element is centered inside of basically our anchors, the line of our anchors. And that center point, by the way, is denoted by this little circle. If we start upping the position, you'll note that the center now is, say, 100 pixels to the right of that line. Once we have that, we can then define a width. And you'll note that our width is inverted right now. We have a negative width, which is why you see this red X. This means that this is not rendering. So let's set this to a positive value, say 100 pixels. So what we've said is from this anchor, we're going to go over 100 pixels. That's going to be our center. And then we're going to have 100 pixel width for this UI element. Now, as soon as I move the anchors, then you're going to see that this reverts to left and right, and we now have different values in there. So this is sort of a special mode when we make these two anchors what they call coincident at the same point. And likewise, if I set the Y to the bottom, then we have the same thing. Now we have a position and a height, and say so we make this 100. This means that we are centered along our pivot. We have no offset in the Y direction, and we have a height of 100. Great, we're getting very close. The last thing we need to know here is this pivot. And this pivot, we already talked about, it's this circle in the center. So if I start moving this value, you'll note that my circle doesn't change, but my image does, which is really weird and counterintuitive. But the reason is my image is relative to the circle, and the circle is relative to the anchor, and the anchor is relative to the parent. So I'll say that again because that is confusing. Whatever my image is, all of its attributes are going to be relative to this point. This point, then, is going to be relative, um, and I'm just going to set this back to 0.5 for a second. This point is going to be relative to our anchors. That's our offset value. Our anchors are going to be relative to this. That's our anchors value. So our pivot tells us where inside of our element is sort of the point we're calculating. Basically, the same as a, a game object, where is the, the zero, zero position of that element? So if I were to set the pivot, pivot, say, to the top, then we'll see that our circle goes to the top of the element, and our element stretches down, and as we change the height, it moves down away from the pivot. So hopefully through these examples, you've seen how all of these things work. So let's get back to what we were trying to create. I want 
a title element. And what I want is I want a 20 pixel boundary all the way around. I want it to have a height of 50 pixels and I want it to take up pretty much the full width but not change with the height of the parent. So let's create that with this new image. So the first thing we know is we want it pinned to the top. Actually, I'm gonna leave this on so you can see as we're working. We want this pinned to the top, so we want the pivot to be where it is now. Uh, we want the pivot to be at the top center of our cube, and then we are going to set our anchors. We wanna be anchored to the top. We wanna to always be relative to the top of our parent. So instead of y is zero, which is the bottom, we're gonna set y is one, and now, as we change our parent, we see that we are stuck to the top of it. And we can very easily define our height. And again, that height is relative to the top. Uh, if I had the pivot set to, say, 0.5, then you'll see that it's a lot harder to try and get it positioned and then adjust the height. And oh, now I need to position it again. So that's why we set that pivot to the top. It makes it a lot easier for us to very simply define how things are going to be laid out. And I said I wanted 20 pixels all around. That's what these offsets are. So I'm going to say 20 in from the left, 20 in from the top, 20 in. Uh, oops, I first need to set these anchors. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll just set this to 100 for a second. Um, I need the anchor set so that the left side is pinned to the left and the right side is pinned to the right. And that's how it's going to stretch with our parent. So x is going to go from 0, the left side, to 1, the right side. Now I can correctly set these. So I'm going to say 20 from the left, 20 from the top, 20 from the right. And my height is going to be, I don't remember, I think we had it at about 100. Uh, let me just double check. Nope, it was 50. OK, so we're still not correct. And that's because we set our position of y to 20. Note how when we set our left and our right, it moved us inward. But when we set our position, it actually just moved us as we normally would in the x and y. So this is going to be a little confusing. These offsets move us inward from the parent. When we set position y, that just moves us in the x and y in sort of the regular unity coordinate system. So this actually needs to be negative 20. And this will take a little getting used to, but before long, you'll be able to do this without problem. And now if I turn my other element off, we'll see that we've successfully recreated that behavior. I'm going to flip back to my transform tool. We can see that we are anchored to the top, that we dynamically change our width relative to the parent element as it gets bigger and smaller. And we can see that we don't change our width as we move up and down. Now, one thing that you'll note here, um, these values do not change even though the parent has changed. So these are always going to be relative values for the parent. You'll note that I make the parent significantly smaller. This doesn't change. That's the power of dynamic UI elements. We set it once, and as our game is playing, if we're changing our parents, it's going to respond accordingly. So we've gone through all of these elements. The last thing we need to talk about is the gizmos that we have available. So in the top left, we have a drop down here, and these are presets. These allow us to move our anchors to places we would most likely want them. And right now, it tells us that we are anchored to stretch along the top, which is correct. If we didn't want to stretch along the top, we can start clicking on these different elements, and it's going to change our values in the inspector. So I am now centered to the top, which means that if I change my parent, you'll note that I no longer stretch with it. I can set myself to just be centered relative to the parent, and you'll note that now, uh, oops, I was in the wrong element. If I set myself to centered in the parent, you'll note that we now don't keep our position nicely from the top and the bottom. We are now relative to the center of the parent, and we're above that center point. So these are very useful shortcuts. And you can hold down, on Windows, you'll hold down Shift and Alt. On Mac, you'll hold down um, Option and Command. Um, as you set these, it will move them into position and it will all, sorry, it will move the pivot and it will also set the position to sort of counterbalance it so it doesn't actually move around. And as I hold that, these down, you'll note that the images actually change. And the last thing that would be good to know is around scaling of elements. And typically we don't set the scale. 
If you want something to be, say, twice as wide, or you want to otherwise adjust the size, you do so via the offsets and the anchors, not using the scale. Now you can adjust the scale, and things will scale accordingly, and you can even invert the scale. And the reason that you would want to adjust the scale is during an animation. So say that somebody just clicked on my button, and I want my button to respond to that user press. That's a perfectly fine way to use scale. But if I adjust scale in a permanent way, then all of my values are going to start to be meaningless on all the children because they inherit that scale. So instead of this being a width of 220 pixels, it's a width of 220 pixels times 2.34. And you can see how that's going to make it harder to lay out your UI. So don't set the scale unless you're setting it in a transition or from an animation. So we've gone over how to create various types and various alignments uh, and various responses for UI elements. We've talked about all the parts of the rec transform. We've talked about the offsets. We've talked about the anchors, the pivot, and the regular things, the rotation and scale. And we've shown you how to apply all of these to get the type of effect in your UI that you want.